Hi, you're listening to Stefan Levera Podcast, a show about Bitcoin and Austrian economics brought to you by swan.com. So I just got back from BTC Prague and I did an interview with my friend Peter Dunworth. He is a financial advisor for high net worth individuals and families and he's joining me to talk about some of the pitfalls and opportunities of Bitcoin estate planning and inheritance. So we talk a little bit about why bother with all of this and some of the benefits of it, as well as practical components and what it might look like in the future. And for those of you moon boys, we also talk about his valuation framework for Bitcoin. The lead sponsor of this show is swan.com. And you can also get the Swan Bitcoin app available for Apple or Android. With Swan, you can do safe and easy Bitcoin buys along with recurring purchase plans or one-time buys, also known as smash buys. Swan offers free custody in your own legally owned trust account and free automated withdrawals to your self-custody. Now, Swan started and is known as a dollar cost averaging or auto stacking app, but it's also available for high net worth individuals. Over at swanprivates.com, you can have a trusted partner on your Bitcoin journey with a dedicated Bitcoin expert, access to exclusive events and support for a range of account types. There's also Swan Business for those of you who are with a business and want to stack as part of a business. So go to swan.com to find out more. This show also brought to you by CoinKite.com, the makers of Bitcoin hardware that you can use to secure your coins. Now, most of you know about the cold card, but I think a lot of people are still not familiar with the tap signer. This is a great intermediate and cheaper device that might be useful in a different context. You can use this as perhaps a smaller single signature wallet that's more convenient and you use it to tap sign with apps such as Nunchuck. Another example is you could use this as part of a multi-signature where it is one of the keys in a broader multi-signature setup. The tap signer is a great device and it's recently coming down in price. The blue edition is available for about $30. So this is a great option if you have friends and you want a cheap device to help them get off the exchange or get off the custodian and get started with a hardware device before later they're able to upgrade to other devices like the cold card. So go to coinkite.com and get a discount using code Lavera on your cold cards. And now on to my chat with Peter. Peter, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here, Stefan. Nice to see you. Yeah, so Peter, I've known you for a few years and I know you've been obviously very involved in the Australian Bitcoin scene, uh, especially recently speaking at the Bush Bash and at the uh, Bitcoin Alive also. Um, and uh, yeah, interested to chat with you about uh, what you're doing and uh, you know where you think Bitcoin inheritance needs some work. And I think you have some interesting insights to add on probably what most people are getting wrong about Bitcoin inheritance. So uh, do you want to just start with, I guess it's normally interesting to start with why. Why why care about this to begin with? That's a great question. And I think we as Bitcoiners go through an an enormous amount of pain and suffering with the volatility to provide an outcome, not only for ourselves um, in the form of financial freedom, but I I guess we invest in this asset or buy this asset in the hopes that it will also help set up our future generations. It's a, a... potential, you know, um, asset that will help solve a a whole host of issues that we have. And so um, I think estate planning is really important because for me personally and for our clients, we want to see the benefit of that sacrifice that we make in this day and age be passed on to benefit our beneficiaries, so our children, our wives, you know, once we're gone and it it feels sort of quite short-sighted and particularly with, you know, some fairly um, lengthened time preferences when it comes to Bitcoin to think of just ourselves when this is an asset that has the ability to set up uh, multiple generations into the future. Yeah, so I guess we can summarize that there will be better outcomes from a legal and tax perspective rather than, let's say, uh, you know, what many people are probably doing, which is to quote unquote YOLO and just sort of, it's a, oh, it's a donation to the network or, or just kind of hoping that, let's say, their wife or their children can recover the coins from a 24 word seed or something like this, right? Well, this is the hardest part. I think, you know, if we think about planning, estate planning when it comes to Bitcoin, there are some complexities to it. But I think if you take the time to think about what are the outcomes that you want to achieve, there are some really important things that you can achieve by setting aside some time to do it. And sadly, thinking about one's death and how people pass on Bitcoin from the grave um, was actually the title for presentation I did at Bitcoin Alive. But it's not a great topic that people want to address on a personal level because it's quite confronting thinking about well what happens when I'm not here and 
the, the interesting thing about when you actually go about setting up an estate plan for, for your Bitcoin and what happens after you pass is, you know, and, and this is probably quite contentious and we'll probably get into this a little later, but if you um, use the current legal structures, um, there are some significant benefits from a tax perspective and from a legal perspective that give you um, a whole host of uh, legal uh, preferential legal treatment when it comes to um, protecting assets. So I think a little bit of forethought and thinking about this before you pass can set up your beneficiaries for a much better use of your Bitcoin. Yeah, so let's go into some of those benefits you mentioned, the legal and the tax aspects. So from a, from a legal perspective, I think there are a number of ways to do this. And the best way to do this is probably to highlight, um, you know, an example of this. So um, in Australia, and we look after clients globally, but in Australia, there is um, a, a divorce rate of, say, two in three. Uh, people get divorces and although this is a horrible thing to think about from a personal point of view one of the things that we need to mitigate from a risk perspective is ensuring that our clients have coins for you know basically hold on to their coins for as long as possible and although we as bitcoiners talk about the threat of governments seizing our bitcoin in a you know 6102 style attack um When it comes to statistics the most likely person to take your bitcoin sadly is the person that you're partnered with. And so from a risk mitigation perspective, when you look at estate planning, estate planning might not be of benefit to you and I, but it can be of huge benefit to our children in setting up what's called a testamentary trust in Australia. And basically all Western democracies that are built on British law have have fundamentally a similar type thing that basically this um, this ability to have a testamentary trust and what, what that means is basically you have a will when you pass they set up what's called a testamentary trust on your death, and then all your assets pass into that. And that that testamentary trust basically is the strongest legal protection that you've got against a family law court from future claim on that. So if you've got a daughter or a son, if you want to leave your Bitcoins to them and you think there's a two in three chance that our Bitcoin, you know, that we've worked our entire life to save and hodl, is going to get taken by their partner in the event of a divorce, then you want to put that in the strongest legal framework that will avoid or mitigate the risk of that happening. And this is where, contrary to, you know, and this is quite topical from a a Bitcoiner's perspective, there are certain legal frameworks that are developed that can give you protection from that sort of thing if you play within the framework. And I understand the non-KYC, but if you're playing in the KYC space, space, um, there are some legal protections that are afforded to you that you otherwise might not have. So from a a big picture perspective, um, and I don't pretend to tell people what to do with their Bitcoin, I'll just make that statement up front and clear because you've probably got one of the most sophisticated audiences when it comes to Bitcoin and their level of knowledge. So they they know this stuff, but they might not have heard from a legal perspective why you would want to entertain that conversation. And so that's from a legal side of things. There are some protections on that from an asset protection perspective. And then from a tax perspective, that that trust structure that gets set up on a death basically allows you to distribute um, potentially um, among a number of beneficiaries. So you can actually lower the tax threshold from distributing uh, from, that, from that entity. So all of a sudden we have... Um, not only the tax benefits associated with it, we've got the ability to lower or mitigate risk from a from a family law court, or alternatively, if you um, would have happened to accidentally injure someone, there's no personal claim against those assets because technically, although you've got full use and control of those assets, technically they're not yours. Yeah, interesting. So let's summarize then. So there, you mentioned uh, like a legal protection and potentially the intent, like honoring the intent of the Bitcoin hodler that let's say he wants to give a certain number of coins to his son or daughter. Um, that's one aspect. And you mentioned as well around uh, a tax benefit there that uh, you may be able to have lower tax applied uh, when you're passing those uh, coins on. Uh, and also around asset protection. So I suppose in the case of, let's say, your estate were to get sued, that kind of thing, there might be some protection in that sense also? Absolutely. So you've covered it off on three fronts. The tax is beneficial. The family law court provisions and the protection from basically a separation of of a marriage or a partnership. And then finally, the protection from, um, I guess, uh, litigation from maybe malice or malfeasance. It, it might be a number of things. So there are some pretty good protections with that. Yeah. And uh, one other question in terms of com- contrasting with just a simple will, like as an example, let's say the hodler is, okay, I mean, just to pick 
easy numbers. Let's say um, the hodler has, I don't know, just to pick the easy numbers, let's say the hodler has 10 Bitcoin and he wants to give five to his wife and five to his son or whatever, as an example. And he nominates that kind of thing in the will. How would that be distinct or different in a testamentary trust, like you're saying, as opposed to having that sort of spelled out in a will, if it can be that way? I'm so glad you asked this question because the implications of this from a legal perspective are quite profound. And what we just talked about doesn't really do it justice until you see an example of this. So let's just use the example of a couple. The husband passes away, leaves his Bitcoin, half of them, five to his wife, five to the child. Um, If that wife were to remarry, those five Bitcoin are now up for claim without a testamentary trust when they're not in a testamentary trust. So... Let's just say Bitcoin goes to the moon, this wife marries a new person, and it's not a great relationship, they basically fall out. That partner can then turn around and basically lay claim to half of those Bitcoins in a legal proceeding in the family law court. And so that's kind of a bitter pill to swallow, particularly if you've worked your entire life to provide for your family. Now, the same thing can happen to the son, who that's left to as well. They may get married, and... You know, if they get married young, there's a chance that basically the marriage um, falls apart. In Australia, the, the divorce rates are somewhere close to two in three, which is outrageous, but that's just what we're working with from a statistical perspective. So you've got a two in three chance of going through a divorce. And if those Bitcoins aren't in the legal framework of the, the trust, they're up for claim. So, you know, you can be partnered with someone for two years, get married, and then, oh, uh, you know, there might be an affair or something like that. And that partner then says, well, you've got five Bitcoins. I'd like to have half of them. Or if it's a female claiming, it could actually even be higher. But you could have, I've seen up to 70%. So these legal frameworks are really important from protecting and hodling Bitcoin in the long term. I see. And I suppose you might also have some insight into family battles after somebody has passed right that i guess that that can also happen right that that uh, you know after somebody has passed remaining family members are squabbling over who gets what and how much is there yeah. anything any insight you can share around that and you know in a bitcoin context i i think it's really important to um probably the best rule of thumb i've seen is that you know the the contest of wills typically happen when assets are distributed unequally or it's seen to be unfair to one of the family members. So that's that's the first, basically, the tip is, if you're you know thinking about planning this estate plan, you want to make sure it's fair for everyone. Secondly, it's really important to communicate what the expectations are for everyone as well. And one of the, one of the best things I've seen to help mitigate um, any contention of the will um, after death has been uh, basically an agreement that all of the beneficiaries sign on an annual or a you know, five-yearly basis to confirm that their expectations are X, Y, and Z, and this is what they expect to happen in the will. So this is a document that can basically be presented in court to show that here was the expectation, this is how it was distributed, and it's in line with you know three or four or five documents that they've previously signed to confirm that that's what their expectations were. So I think that's a really powerful tool that, from a legal perspective, it, it doesn't look like it has a lot of weight, but what it shows is a consistency of effort and intent over time which helps build a case if that were to ever get litigated. Uh, that's an interesting point, yeah. And so uh, also, are you able to help explain the concept between possession and title to those, you know, to the coins, right? Because, you know, in Bitcoin, it's not your keys, not your coins, right? In terms of the protocol, but the legal aspect is not necessarily the same. So can you just sort of help explain that aspect for us? I love this because... This is the beauty of Bitcoin, right? Not your keys, not your coins. And the, the interesting thing about this is is that Bitcoin and the cryptography that it's based on, on basically a hierarch- hierarchical basis, cryptography ranks a lot higher than legal claim. <laughs> and this is the funny thing that a lot of lawyers don't quite get. And they think, you know, they don't understand Bitcoin and they don't quite understand that cryptography trumps legal. And what's really important is to marry the two and they're very distinct. You've got a legal claim to Bitcoin, and then you've got the practical application or distribution of that. And this is where I think the legal system will have a huge amount of 
well, it'll have to evolve fairly quickly because what you've got is you need to marry up not only the legal framework for distributing your Bitcoin, but the practical implementation of that. And that's where you have a very... Um, a very unique thing that happens in the distribution of assets upon a death that is totally unique to Bitcoin. If you look at the other assets that get passed, you've typically got property, you've got commodities, you might have um, you might have a whole bunch of stocks, you've got all types of different property, and you might have some bonds. Now, in legal claims over those assets, there is always an authority to appeal. So. If something doesn't go your way or the assets can't be found for whatever reason, you can literally appeal to an authority, you can appeal to a land and titles office, you can appeal to a share share registry and basically say, hey, those are meant to be mine, can you just rename those in my name and basically transfer them to me and it's it's all good. The problem with Bitcoin occurs is, is that you have no appeal to authority. If you don't have the keys and your self-custody, then that represents a huge problem for you as the beneficiary, for the executor, and for anyone who's administering the will. So for the first time, and this is what's really interesting from a legal perspective, these lawyers have no authority to appeal to to just transfer the ownership of the Bitcoin because being an immutable ledger and not your keys, not your coins, there's no one that we can go to, no authority. We can just say, oh, look, it was meant to be in this name, not that name. Can we just backdate that ledger and put it in this name, not the other? And it's like... That's not how this thing works. So there are some really severe consequences. And, you know, we've talked about this over the years, like the the accountability and responsibility in self-custody brings a completely new dimension to, you know, the whole probate and process of death and transfer of assets that I think a lot of Bitcoiners really need to be up to speed and ahead of where their legal team is on this because the legal team won't be able to solve the cryptography problem of the practical transfer of those assets. And that's one of the things that terrifies me. Right, I see, yeah. And so uh, I guess just the terminology, if you could just quickly explain for listeners, maybe they're not familiar, what's an executor, what's a beneficiary, what are some of these just terms that you could uh, help explain? Great, so an executor is when you pass, you typically have someone um, administrate your your affairs. And that is typically an executor, which you appoint in your will. The executor is typically someone close to you that um, you trust to basically handle your affairs and distribute your assets in a way that you see fit. It can be your lawyer. It could be a good friend. It could be your accountant. It could be your financial advisor. It could be one of a number of people. But typically the prerequisite for that is someone that you trust implicitly to carry out your wishes as you see. Now, the beneficiaries is really simple. That's just who's basically getting the goodies. So who's actually going to be receiving or inheriting your assets upon death? Is it going to be your wife? Is it going to be your partner? Is it going to be your children? You might not have children. You might want to leave it to a charitable donation or foundation that you want to support and see do good work. It could be a number of different different things. And this is the beauty and the flexibility of basically creating a will is that you get to determine who's going to benefit from you know all your hodling. Great. And so, with regard to the cryptography component of it, right, the key, not your keys, not your coins, the big challenge, as I'm sure you are very familiar with, is this idea of how can the hodler retain unilateral access to his coins, but also give access to the executor, in this case, to distribute those coins to his heirs or to his wife or whoever, uh, or to the charity, how do you sort of square that circle? How do we thread this needle of not, you know, holding the keys but also having them accessible in the event of, let's say, if the hodler dies or is inca- incapacitated, right? Because not just dying, he could be incapacitate, incapacitated in some way. And that's the thing a lot of people don't remember is that, you know, you don't have to die to lose control of your Bitcoin. You might have bumped your head. You might have had a whole host of things that can go wrong. And this is, <laughs> you raise a really difficult point that a lot of Bitcoiners I don't think have spent enough time and attention on because I I basically spend my day-to-day thinking about this problem and it's a problem I've spent the last six or seven years basically trying to solve for clients that you know you look at the list of things that you can do to do that and how do you mitigate risk well you know you can have that set up in a a, basically a self-custody single sig wallet where you might do a Shamir secret sharing where you basically distribute the words across multiple different places, geographically distributed. It might be in multiple different places. And then that brings in the the concern around 
who are you going to trust to actually rebuild that Shamir secret sharing in a sufficient fashion that will then transport those Bitcoins or send those Bitcoins to where you want them to go? So, I mean, Shamir secret sharing is a great way to do it. And I think it's it's been a, a go-to for a number of people over the years. The interesting thing I look at, and which is what we've done for clients for probably the last three years, maybe a little bit longer, um, which solves that, and it's kind of in a similar vein to that, is effectively a multi-sig collaborative custody arrangement whereby you can have multiple keys distributed to multiple parties and those parties don't need to know about each other but you just need to have a single document that you can basically access to basically get in contact with those people who hold multiple keys to basically bring together and rebuild that multi-sig and then transfer it to whatever type of structure that you want to see and and this is where I think the multi-sig for me in a collaborative format solves a lot of issues post-death. And I know it's not a popular way to do this, but the, the best way I've seen to do this is is in a collaborative custody whereby typically we might set up an account with Unchained or Casa or Nunchuck or it might be whatever platform they want to use. And the beauty of that is is that these guys are absolute experts in that multi-sig arrangement and they have they hold a key for the client. It's their account, they hold a key as nunchuck or unchained or whatever that might be we personally set up a single single key for the client so they have control of a single single sig and then we hold a default key for them that if they mess up everything that we do if they literally walk out the room and die then most importantly we can recover that bitcoin for their family for their estate for their beneficiaries and that's the trade-off we've made and you know, there's no solutions, only trade-offs in Bitcoin, sadly. And this right. is something that we've had to get comfortable with that, you know, from a Bitcoin maxi perspective, we don't think it satisfies 100% from a Bitcoin maxi perspective because it's not 100% ownership of your keys. It's probably 95% of the way there in solving that, not your keys, not your coins, because you've got basically big reputations in all of those companies that I just mentioned. And you've got a default backup key in us who we've been doing it for you know, a number of years now. That gets us, I think, the best way to solving the problem which you raised when we first started talking about this is how do you share a secret from the grave? Because that's fundamentally what you're doing with those 24 words. It's There's a level of trust that's required at some point in time if you're not here. And one of the things that I think is the hardest thing to do is, and one of the things we want to take all clients through is, we want to show them that this process and protocol basically works without their involvement. And when they can see that process work without their involvement, there's a level of pressure that's taken off their shoulders that they think, oh my goodness, I can actually see something working without my involvement and I've got all of the, that they're comfortable with the trade-offs. And this is something that I think multi-sig, and this is where I'm really excited about what multi-sig brings to the party and the upgrades with Taproot and the rest of it. This brings a whole level of custodianship that I think is going to help enable or help move the uh, self-custody adoption from, say, the half a percent right the way through to 10 or 20% of the, the population will now be able to comfortably and confidently self-custody. And this is where I think it's really important that we grow that self-custody pie because from a personal perspective, probably my major driver in, in seeing this happen is I would love to see every coin off the exchange. Yeah. Now, from a selfish point of view... I would love to see what this, these exchanges do when there are no Bitcoins on there. Now, <laughs> then we're going to see yeah. real price discovery, right? So Trace with his, you know, January 3, get your coins off exchange. Like, this is what I want to see. And I think multi-sig in a collaborative format helps give people confidence to self-custody when they otherwise wouldn't. And it opens up a whole new market um, to self-custody in Bitcoin that I don't think has been addressed yet. And this is where I'm really excited for the guys who work at all of these multi-sig companies that I think they've got a pile of clients that are going to come down the road that actually see this as an easier, safer way to self-custody than holding a single-sig wallet. Right. And I think... So, yeah, and this is something many companies are looking at. I know even even at Swan, um, there is a, you know, Swan uh, Vault kind of product that, uh, you know... uh, this is public, right? It's not uh, private information that, that, that the team will be coming out with something like this. But as you said, the idea is having a collaborative multi-signature provider who maybe holds one key 
And let's say in this case, the hodler holds one key, and in 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 and in a two or three setup, maybe their advisor holds that third key. So maybe that's one way to do it. There are other ways that it could be done. Maybe the maybe it's like a three or five, and they're holding two keys. Uh, you know, there there are kind of different aspects of how it could be done. Um, and uh, certainly, I appreciate the point about uh, it's not as a uh, purist unilateral control, uh, but there's a trade off that's being made there around giving that person a little bit more confidence that the key, the keys and the coins will make it to their heirs or beneficiaries. Uh, and I think, as you mentioned, having it in multi-sig across different institutions still really helps because now that concern around paper, Bitcoin and fractional reserve is being mitigated because if you can see your coins or see those coins on chain or you know you can see that output there, you know it hasn't been rehypothecated because that's that's all there is. And as soon as you know uh, it it has to move, that's it. There's no rehypothecation, or at least it's stopping that rehypothecation. So I think that's an interesting point. Um, and so I think it's also interesting just to chat a little bit about where you're seeing the space in terms of as you survey, let's say, the landscape and you look at accountants, lawyers, advisors out there. How Bitcoin savvy are they today, right? Because obviously you, people like us, people who are listening to this show, we're obviously a bit more Bitcoin savvy, interested in Bitcoin. But what's the state of play, you know, just out there generally? I, I think it's a passing interest at the moment. And particularly in light of a two-year bear market, there is very little interest from any professionals wanting to get involved in this. And this is where I think for the professionals who are making a name for themselves in this space, there there is going to be a huge retention and uh, effectively knowledge gap for them to basically bridge for their other counterparts in their professions. I, I look at from the, the industries that we work with, we work with financial advisors, we work with lawyers, and, you know, we work with... Um, investment advisors as well, and accountants. And I look at that and I think the accounts are slowly getting up to speed because there are, um, you know, they basically have to account for it and they want to account for it on a, on a decent way. And it's very um, interesting seeing them try to wrap their heads around basically, um, you know, basically transaction information that's been taken off the block and just thrown at them. <laughs> it's very different to what they're used to. But what's interesting is from a, you know, from an immutable perspective and from a, a confirmation of trust, that information that they get there is way more trustworthy than any of the numbers that they get um, from anything else. And, you know, a joke I love to share, which um, you probably might appreciate, is how do you know if you've got a good accountant? Ask them what one plus one is. If they're any good, they'll look behind them, shut the blind, and then they'll whisper gently in your ear, what, what do you want it to be? <laughs> and that basically is the problem with the accounting system that we've got at the moment, the double entry ledger, which I think back to Bitcoin and the beauty of it, the immutable ledger and a triple entry ledger system is going to solve a whole host of those problems that there's going to be a lot less fudging that we can do with the numbers because it's a far superior form of accounting. But back to the point around what does what do the changes mean? I think there are some very... Um, forward-thinking professionals in this space. I know we deal with a number of estate planners in the space. We deal with some accountants and uh, other investment advisors, and they're trying to actively pursue this and understand it because they see the opportunity that's coming. They just don't have any resources to draw on for further product or professional development. So that, that's probably a bit of a missing gap for, for helping other professionals get into the space. There's just a huge amount of hard work and hard slog that you've basically got to you know, stub your toe on, make all the mistakes yourself before there's a, a learning curve. There's no manual for any of these professions. Back to the show in a moment. This show is also brought to you by Plan B Forum Lugano. So for those of you who don't know, Lugano is a city in Switzerland and they are taking on Bitcoin adoption. They have real adoption with hundreds of places where you can spend sats over the Lightning Network. So they've got a forum or a conference coming up October 20th and 21st. This forum will host awesome speakers like Nick Zabo, Adam Back, Paolo Arduino, Prince Philip, Giacomo Zucco, Mike Peterson from Bitcoin Beach, and many more. There will be a main stage, 
a lightning and peer-to-peer stage, as well as masterclasses where Bitcoiners can learn skills relating to self-custody, multi-sig, setting up your lightning or Bitcoin node, and there'll also be an art gallery. As I mentioned, it's real adoption. There are hundreds of places around town, whether that's cafes, restaurants, bars, and more. So book your tickets over at planb.lugano.ch for Plan B Forum, October 20th and 21st. When I go to send an on-chain transaction, I check mempool.space to target the fee for my transaction. And this allows me to make sure that I'm setting an appropriate fee rate. Bitcoin is growing beyond a single layer into a fully-fledged multi-layer ecosystem. And mempool.space helps you see and explore that ecosystem from the mempool to the blockchain to second layer networks like the lightning network and with mempool.space you don't have to trust a third party it's free and open source software you can host it yourself with one click on some of the full node distributions like umbral and raspberry blitz and more mempool will be coming out with a transaction accelerator in the coming months so keep an eye out for more information on that and go check it all out over at mempool.space and now back to the show yeah, and even when it comes to things like Bitcoin competence, right? Understanding how a multi-sig works, understanding how a hardware wallet or a hardware signing device works, or understanding maybe if you've got a 24-word seed, but it's a part of a multi-sig and that is only one piece and that you need multiple signatures in order to be able to sign uh, that transaction. So things like that, I'm sure there's a lot of learning that has to take place over time, uh, especially in the case of that executor who's having to execute this stuff and potentially the professionals, whether they're legal, accounting, tax, advisor, professionals who are guiding and maybe even in the, depending on the situation, they may be holding a key in this as well also. There's a learning curve that needs to happen. And this is where I think partnering with professionals in this space is really important, particularly on the transfer of death. And one thing that's really unique and speaking from experience, um, you know, proud but sad at the same time that you know we've overseen basically the transfer of three estates now from death to to their beneficiaries and there's been some great stories around that professionally i'm really proud to say that we haven't lost a single bitcoin with the protocol that we've put in place so a collaborative multi-seat custody whereby unchained holds a key the client holds a key and we hold a key has worked absolutely seamlessly there's been zero loss and um there have been a couple of funny stories, and I might just talk in hypotheticals because I'm not allowed to talk about clients, but, sure, you know, yeah. um, many moons ago, um, you you came and helped us with a whole host of things, and one of those clients has sadly passed away, but we were able to safely transfer those Bitcoins um, from from this person who happened to be about uh, mid-80s to, to their children. And a funny thing happened when we were basically going through the process. We managed to seamlessly transfer them to to the client. And at the same time, I looked at their asset allocation and realized um, 60% of their investable assets were invested in Bitcoin. And I was shocked. I was like, oh, I didn't quite realize it was that high. And when I went to the children to say, hey, just want to let you know, we're probably mm, a little bit overweight in Bitcoin. Should we reweight the portfolio and do that? And one thing I need to thank you for with your work, because, you know, you helped educate them. Um, they turned around and said, no, we're really comfortable with the weighting. We don't need to readjust anything. <laughs> so <laughs> I was going to say, I was so happy. <laughs> and, um, you know, it saved a whole host of things. But the transition was seamless and the transition would have been seamless with or without their hardware device if we had it or not we could have got that to them and we've had multiple experiences where clients have walked out the door i've said be really careful with this key be really careful with your seed words lock them up in a safe or a safety deposit box or wherever you do it and you know treasure them because it's really important and literally a month later we've had a client call and say um i've lost the words i've lost my device have I lost my Bitcoin? And I can report with hand on heart, so happy about this. Um, I said to the client, no, but you need to come in as quickly as possible because we're down to two keys and I never want a client in that position that they're reliant on the two keys. So we got the client in as quickly as possible. They were very grateful that they hadn't lost that because there was basically millions of dollars on the line. And I think the comment came back with, you know, I'm so happy. I, I think I would have had a divorce. My wife would have divorced me <laughs> if I had have lost a million dollars sitting on that single device. So this is where I've, I've got to say from, you know, doing this for years, the experience I've seen in how little attention some people can pay to that 
you know, that hardware device and the redundancies that are built in with a collaborative custody arrangement. It's not for the hardcore Bitcoiners who want to have full self-custody, but it's a it's 95% of the way there. And it's probably the best solution that I've found to basically ensure that you can transfer your Bitcoin to your beneficiaries. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think perhaps in the future, now this is something actually I can share. I recently was at BTC Prague and I was chatting with some of the guys from the company known as Revolt, but they've got a product called Liana. Um, and this is using an advanced Bitcoin technology called Miniscript. And there's potential here, and this would be very interesting for you in the future as well, is using Miniscript, it will be possible to put in even more advanced conditions such that the hodler, the user can be full self-custody and there can still be a sort of recovery pathway in the future. Now, I should disclose, um, as part of Bitcoin Adventures, uh, we did invest in uh, that company, but I think just broadly about Miniscript, it can enable more advanced scripting with that multi-sig. So as an example, um, we can do all kinds of things like, okay, let's say you and I were in a business together, Peter, we could set up a two of two for spending, but after six months of us not spending, it becomes a two of three. So it's like an expanding multi-sig. And let's say the board, the director of the board has a key and he can sign in the case that you and I don't agree, right? Or there's like this idea of a kind of a deep recovery key. So you could have it so that let's say it's normally a two of three or two of two or normally, you know, in our full self-custody or the hodler's self-custody. But if it's not been spent for 10 years, then and only then, can the provider have this kind of I forgot my password functionality? And so maybe it will sort of help thread the needle. Now, to be clear, this is very early. It's very techy. It's, you know, extremely early stuff. But I think if we were to fast forward five or 10 years time, this might be a lot more uh, commonplace and take it even to the next level. I, I think you're right on that. And I've talked to a number of different teams I think I've got to call in with those guys because what I find really interesting is from a um, uh, basically a term we call in estate planning, ruling from the grave, with the testamentary trust, you can basically issue a legal mandate that um, as part of the trust, you're only allowed to draw an income from the trust and you're allowed to take 1% in the first year, 2% in the second year, 3%. And you can literally stage, you can rule, rule from the grave is what they call it. Now, that's up for legal contest when it's in the will. However, if you programmatically, cryptographically <laughs> secure it <laughs> with Miniscript, <laughs> there's no discussing, there's no debate. It just is what it is. And that beneficiary then has no legal recourse because even if there is legal recourse to it, <laughs> there's no cryptographic recourse The blockchain to it, does so. not recognise the legal Correct. authority, let's say. <laughs> Correct. That's exactly right. So there are just so many wonderful things coming down the road with the programmatic uh, being able to program Bitcoin that from an estate planning perspective and being able to basically plan out how people are going to spend Bitcoin in the future or how they're going to inherit it. Uh, uh, there's no other asset on earth that comes close to it. And this is where, you know, my day-to-day -day is basically dealing with high net worth families and how to secure that wealth into the long term. Once they really understand, like the broader, you know, high net worth families really understand how powerful a tool this is, that no other asset can deliver these sorts of things that Bitcoin can, game's over. Like there'll be a much higher percentage of their assets in Bitcoin. Yeah, and I think that's totally right. I think for a lot of people, that can be a hang-up. I've heard this is a common thing as well, even from customers and just people in general, that there are people who maybe they are hesitant to self-custody their coins because of some of these considerations. And because of that reason, they just think, oh, I'd rather trust somebody else. Now, of course, you and I and probably most listeners are thinking, no, not your keys, not your coins. We want you to be self-sovereign you should self-custody. And of course, you know, I do. Anyone who can self-custody, you should. I, I definitely, you know, I say that. Um, but I'm just recognizing the reality that there are a lot of these high net worth people who are not comfortable with that until maybe the technology and the security and the safety of this stuff is improved. And maybe that comes with further mini script adoption and development and technology. And part of that is also the legal aspects and the accounting and the advisors all skilling up and creating products and services around this kind of thing as you have um so do yeah do you want to i guess 
tell us a little bit about the journey that they that a customer would go on if they're trying to set this up with you, just so people understand, like, what does it look like in practice? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take you on a journey. There, there are two types of journey. There is a journey for a seasoned Bitcoiner who understands exactly what we're doing and how we're doing it, which I have great joy in basically delivering because once they see all the built-in redundancies and backups that we've got, it takes a huge amount of pressure off their shoulders, and particularly if they've been operating outside of that multi-sig and a single-sig environment. But from a client who's completely new, and this is something I'm really proud of that I don't think anyone else on earth does, literally, is that we have the ability to take a client who is completely new to Bitcoin, has no Bitcoin whatsoever, and set up an account for them, set up an unchained account, help them buy Bitcoin, set up a hardware wallet, and literally set up a multi-sig vault that they have full control over, and they can have Bitcoin in there within an hour. And this is something that I'm really proud of because it's a far better solution than leaving Bitcoins on exchange. It gets us probably 95% of the way there to satisfying that, you know, Bitcoin maxi Puritan type thing. And I haven't met a Bitcoin maxi yet who thinks that that is a worse idea than leaving it on the exchange. And then that gets people really deep down the rabbit hole really quickly. And clients either are happy just saying that it's all looked after and Or alternatively, it sparks a curiosity for them that they want to understand, well, what's this multi-sig? What's this hardware wallet? How does this work? What are the consequences of doing X, Y, and Z? And they can start playing with it. But our clientele are typically much older, so they need a lot of hand-holding to get through that. And it literally might take an hour or two to get all of that set up and Bitcoin in there. But the beauty of that is it gives them confidence that they're working with professionals that know what they're doing and haven't lost a Bitcoin. So... Most importantly, they know they're not going to lose their Bitcoin because everyone's heard the stories of, you know, the guy basically throwing his out throwing out his hardware drive in England and basically trying to pay a rubbish tip sixty four million dollars to recover three hundred million pounds in Bitcoin. Those sorts of things don't happen, and you know, particularly in light of what's happening with Binance, which is quite topical. It's the thirteenth of May two thousand and twenty three. We've got you know the SEC's um, reviewing and investigating Binance. You've got Coinbase in legal action with the SEC, one of the world's largest, so the two largest exchanges on earth are basically in legal proceedings with the US um, Securities Commission. And this self-custody in a multi-sig basically gets clients out of the way of any regulatory framework that they could basically fall under, and it helps them self-custody. So it's a much better outcome, I believe, than what's available at the moment, leaving it on exchange. Right, yeah, so sorry, 13th of June, not May, but uh, yeah, but certainly at that point, yeah. But no, that's correct. And uh, certainly getting out of the blast zone, right, the radius of these exchanges that can get shut down or custodians that can basically screw you over, whereas if you are in a collaborative custody or some kind of multi-sig context and you're self-custodying, you're just you're just miles away, you're miles out of there. Um, and yeah. so that's really interesting. Um, I think it might be interesting as well just to talk a little bit about legal approaches around the world, right? Because obviously you and I are both Australian, but how does it work in, let's say, other big countries around the world like the US, like the UK uh, or others? From a client perspective, how do we do that? Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess, yeah. I mean, just in terms of the legal aspects, um, are there legal differences that change how you have to operate this or is it, essentially the same kind of operating model regardless of what legal you know uh, uh, environment they're operating in yeah Uh, from my experience and we've basically got calls into the us the uk europe we look after the us the uk europe now we've got clients in portugal um, asia um, hong kong singapore new zealand and australia so it's basically global but when you look at how this is set up and what what is the service that's delivered. It's effectively a technical service. So despite the fact that I've got a financial background and an Australian financial services license, we've gone through all of the licensing regime with our compliance team to look at, well, what type of financial product are we actually delivering advice on here? And without giving any asset recommendations about, hey, you need to have a 5 or 10 or 50% weighting to Bitcoin, which is something we don't really get into, um, that basically lives outside the financial framework and the regulatory guidelines from a financial 
product perspective. So in Australia, there's no legal framework for giving advice on Bitcoin because it's not classified as a financial product. In the UK, that's a similar thing. In the US, it's not a financial product. We've seen the CFTC basically designated as a commodity. So it doesn't skirt that. And then when you are setting up a collaborative custody arrangement, if we were to have control of two of the three keys, then that represents a very different model. That effectively, you need to be a custodian. You need to have all of the, you need to submit to all of the rules and regulatory requirements that a custodian would have to uh, submit to in any of the designations that they want to play in. But when you're only holding one of the three keys, you have no control over that. So there's no way in, well, there's no legal way, there's no possible way for me to control those bitcoins. So by default, we have no control of that, so we're not a custodian. What we are is effectively a default backup key, and we've set up a really neat system and a protocol that, you know, part of the reason of, you know, wanting to talk to you is to share that protocol that we think can help improve clients' outcomes. And this is something we'd love to help with if, you know, they're not capable of looking after it, but we want to share this with the world because this is basically six or seven years giving advice on Bitcoin for high net worth families. This is the best we've come up with to help transfer wealth to the next generation. And, you know, for all the Bitcoiners who are here now, you've put in a huge amount of work and effort to get to this point and you're really early. And it'd be a shame not to capitalize on that if you don't secure the transfer to your beneficiaries. So that's yep. part of the process of what we wanted to deliver. Yeah. And just from a legal perspective, you mentioned the testamentary trust. Does that change in across jurisdictions or is there like a different entity or different kind of uh, vehicle that's being used in other jurisdictions or is it absolutely, essentially? Absolutely. Yeah. So the US has got a whole host of things that you can use. You can use um, an irrevocable uh, living trust, I think is one of the things that they, they determine where you can basically put assets in a trust now and that can be for the benefit of your future generations that you've got full control over until you you pass away, which is a great way of doing it. Again, there are some legal uh, carve-outs that effectively help protect you in the event that you have a divorce if you've claimed that legal trust. It depends on which state you are. Um, Louisiana was the worst state to, to be in because that's based on French, French common law, not British common law. Um, you've also got some... Um, I think in the Western states, you've also got some uh, Spanish influence on the the legal frameworks there, particularly California, the rest of it, obviously, with the connection to Mexico. So um, the testamentary trusts in Australia, they work really well, but under basically all, all British law um, basically has that foundation or some some inkling to that. So I would suggest having, if depending on what jurisdiction you're in, have a chat to an estate planner in that and ask for the equivalency of a testamentary trust to be set up that would protect you and give you those those protections and, and tax advantages. Great. And so for listeners who are unfamiliar with the inheritance taxes, could you just give a rough overview of what that looks like around the world? I know obviously I'm, you don't have to give it every country, but just for major countries, what does inheritance tax look like? It's rough. It's really rough, I've got to say, like depending on where you are. Um, Let's start with the US because that's the biggest market and, you know, I love the US, but, you know, I've heard, you know, that the US has um, some form of death duties to the tune of 40%. That's a big whack to pay on the way out the door. Um, so if you're inheriting something from, you know, from your father or for your mother or other, some other loved one, you know, the government could take a 40% clip of that straight off the top. So if you've got 10 bitcoins, you end up with six. That's That's a real kick that's a real kick in the guts. Like, that's that's really hard. You look across to UK and Europe, they've got similar death taxes. Um, ironically, Australia is a great place to die. <laughs> We've got zero, <laughs> no inheritance zero tax. death duties. And um, another great place to die, and this is so morbid, I can't believe we're laughing about it, but a great place to die is New Zealand as well. So, you know, despite being, you know, queen of the lockdowns and all that, it's, it's a great place to die because there's no inheritance tax there. Or death duties. Interesting, yeah, and uh, yeah, I guess it, this can all change. Like there'll be, there might be changes along the way, and even who knows, right? In some countries, there may be wealth taxes, or even worse, unrealized gains taxes. Oh you know, so even that's something to worry about on the way there. And then yeah. some of these countries will have a, te- de- a tax even. You know, you've been paying taxes all the way through, and then after you die, ah, oh, here's another, you know, forty percent or whatever pay up. Um, so that's unfortunate. 
It's horrible. And this is where, you know, there's a tax arbitrage going on right now. You know, you look at, you know, there's a whole host of expats leaving Australia because they can live a, you know, live a, a quality life overseas, pay very little tax. Our tax rate in Australia is 49.5%, you know, on a person. That's, you know, that's quite big. We don't get a lot of incentives. There's not a lot of things to write off. And, you know, there are really close tax jurisdictions like, you know, uh, say Singapore or Hong Kong, which might charge a maximum of 10 or 15% tax. That's far more appealing than, you know, a 50% tax rate. And then there's capital gains tax to pay on that as well. I think what what's apparent to me is, you know, we need to be vigilant from an advice perspective that, you know, it's very clear to me that the governments are running out of money and they're running out of options. And an easy, low-hanging fruit for them to basically claim is an inheritance tax of rich people. Oh, let's just tax them 50%. They don't need it. They didn't earn it. You know, we'll just take it. And, you know, who's really going to cry for, you know, someone who's inheriting 50 million instead of 100? It's an easy sell to the, to, to the public, but it sets a very slippery slope that the public doesn't realise that if they're in that state, the, the government finances are in a shocking way. So um, basically, um, your beneficiaries can basically uh, shop jurisdictions on where they want to accept their inheritance, and that might lead to a better outcome. So you might become a New Zealand resident for a year and basically pick up a tax-free inheritance. <laughs> Interesting idea there. Um, and also, I had a couple comments uh, in uh, who were saying you've got to ask Peter. This one, this one's for the Moon Boys. So uh, they want to know <laughs> about Peter. About, they want to know your thoughts on where you think Bitcoin is going uh, in terms of valuations. Uh, you're known for being uh, an Uber bull. So can you give us a little bit of an overview there? Would you like? The number, or would you like the framework? I'd prefer to talk about the I think framework. The, I think the framework is a better uh, discussion piece. Great. Well, the framework I'm much happy to talk about because I don't like talking about the number because it it seems quite insane to tell you the truth. But let me just set the, the framework for, um, firstly, if everyone understood just how bad property bonds and stocks were and how much risk was residing in those relative asset classes, Bitcoin would be tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars right now. There is there are so many problems in those asset classes, I can't begin to tell you. And we'd need a whole hour at least to discuss just one of those. But if we look at the framework for what Bitcoin is, and you know, this has been a study of money for me for a long time. I've been involved in accounting and finance at university, been in credit markets. Uh, my job is literally to mitigate risk. And you look at what Bitcoin is, and fundamentally, I think it's a, a function of money. And you look at those three functions of money, we've got store of value, mean of exchange, and unit of account are uh, what makes the money. Interestingly, and I don't see a lot of this talked about, but I think the key innovations that pertain to those three functions of money from Bitcoin's you know, tech innovation perspective is absolute digital scarcity of 21 million, which we're all familiar with, um, seizure resistance, which is a novel thought, and it's only been available since Bitcoin's been invented because up until now, a $5 wrench attack basically got you everything that person had because either they were holding it on person or alternatively there was an appeal to authority that you just took it from. So this is a very unique concept, seizure resistance. And, you know, I'm, I'm not sticking up for Russia here, but I bet they, they really understood Bitcoin prior to having their $500 billion in foreign reserves held or frozen. Um, I'd call that seized. But then you look at the second or third innovation with, you know, tech innovation with Bitcoin has been the censorship resistance. You know, that is a huge improvement on what we've currently got. Anyone who subscribes to the network's rules can basically place a transaction or make a communication, a message on the system, which we abstract to a dollar value. Now, you know, I was particularly concerned about the disregard for the rules and laws that have been in place when the Canadian truckers basically protested and I thought they were within their rights to do that. They may have overstepped the mark, but I thought what was an egregious overstep of, you know, the governments there was without any due process, they basically froze the, the truckers' bank accounts. Now, the whole Western democracies are built upon the presumption of innocence until proven guilty, not the other way around. So I was particularly disturbed seeing that the governments were basically happy to flaunt process on the proviso that they thought terrorists were going to take over the country. I thought this is a really slippery slope that I don't want to see because, you know, it was convenient for Canadian truckers, but what happens when it's, you know, mum's complaining about something? 
you know, it's a very different slippery slope. So censorship resistant is a big, big deal. And then the final one, which I think gets no love, but maybe you and I can froth on this for a little while because, you know, we've both got somewhat of an accounting background, is the immutable ledger supply and issuance. Now, it gets no love because it's a really boring topic and accounts aren't known for being the life of the party, but <laughs> this is where the, the, the real value in Bitcoin lies is that in an immutable ledger, um, it opens up things that we haven't thought about. So when you think about those four key innovations and how that applies to Bitcoin and the functions of money, store of value basically gets an upgrade on gold because it's uh, absolute digital scarcity and it's seizure resistant. So that is unequivocally better than gold. So it should be at least a 10 to $14 trillion market cap, depending on the day. From medium exchange, it gets an upgrade on the US dollar that we're currently using, which is a $100 trillion market, give or take, depending on the day. You've got uh, censorship resistant, which is a huge thing. And then you've got an immutable issuance and supply. So you know exactly what's coming and when it's coming, which is much better than you know the 40% increase in the M2 money supply that we've seen in the last you know, two or three years. Like, on top of that, we've seen a 6 or 7% decrease in the money supply in the last, you know, year. So it's like, it's just so chaotic trying to determine an economic, economic system with that type of volatility. So it's an improvement on medium exchange. And then the final one, the grand one, which I think holds the, the most value is your unit of account. Basically, Bitcoin represents an upgrade on the double entry ledger technology that we're using at the moment. That's basically 500 years old from the Venetians, Basically, we haven't had any upgrades to accounting in the last 500 years. So this represents a triple entry ledger system. It represents an immutable ledger that can't be changed. And we've got an immutable supply and issuance that goes across with that as well. And all of a sudden, this expands, I think, the ability of unit of account to account for a whole lot more than what it does, or it expands it pie dramatically. And where I think Bitcoiners have probably not thought about this from a market perspective is that... For the first time in history, and I call Bitcoin the first triple point asset. So in thermodynamics, the triple point is when in a beaker of glass, you have, say, water sitting there. But under certain pressure, under certain temperatures, you get not only water, but you can have ice and you can have steam all in the one beaker at the one time. And so I call Bitcoin the first triple point asset because you have basically with an immutable supply and absolute digital scarcity, it's a pressure that basically gets put on the money that you have all three forms or functions of money in one asset at the same time. And what's unique about this is, is that you've got Bitcoin is the best store of value, it's the best mean of exchange, and it's the best unit of account. And now this is a revolution in historical terms that never before have we seen one asset dominate all three functions of money. And so my contention is, rather than thinking about Bitcoin being a linear accretion of value whereby you take a 10 billion market cap of gold, 100 trillion for medium exchange in the US dollar, and I think unit of accounts running at 2,000 trillion, but you put whatever numbers in you want to. Um, most Bitcoiners are thinking about this, well, you add 10 trillion plus 100 plus 2,000, you get to 2.1 trillion dollars. Personally, after watching how, um, ironically, um, how people do crazy things when scarcity is basically um, in play. Um, I'll give you a quick example. I've watched people lose their minds about 300 metres from my office down there in Double Bay Woolworths when the toilet paper was running out. People were having physical fights when they thought the toilet paper was running out. Now, it was not going to be on the shelves for two days and people could have gone home and had a shower, used a bidet, used a leaf, used a tissue... There are multiple ways to basically work around no toilet paper, but people were getting in physical fights because they thought it was scarce. Now, what happens when 8 billion people realise that Bitcoin is absolute digital scarcity and they're all competing for one asset? This is where I think, rather than thinking it's a linear accretion of value, I think it's more like store of value multiplied by medium of exchange multiplied by unit of account and Bitcoin can hold an infinite value. So all of a sudden, people are going to really understand that this thing is worth way more than we can we can possibly imagine. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic framework. And I think really people should take it seriously. This idea of it's, you know, it's starting, it's a digital property, right? Like Michael Saylor says, but 
over time, it's going to evolve into so much more and it's, it's going to be a, an everyday currency that we'll use. And as you say, it will be the unit of account. And so for those of us who are thinking ahead, we value our net worth in Bitcoin terms and we are serious about planning for the future because, right, if you believe, if you truly believe Bitcoin is going to be the money of the world, it will be the unit of account of the world someday, maybe not today, you know, it might be decades, we don't know. Uh, it, I guess it behooves all of us to really take it seriously and plan so that our children can actually receive this asset rather than it uh, being a, a donation to the network, as Satoshi famously said. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. let's conclude with a few actionable pieces of advice. Do you have any key insights or key uh, points that you want to make sure if, they, if, you know, if there was one thing they took away, what's the key piece of uh, advice or insight that you would give them? I, I think if, if I could ask everyone listening to this podcast to do an exercise, if they can ask their loved one or their most trusted, hand them a piece of paper with a note on it saying, please attempt to move my Bitcoin. Now, it's a scary thought. It's very daunting, and I don't want to you know, scare people. But by doing this simple exercise, you will understand if your estate plan is up to your death or not. And it's the most critical piece, and this is literally what I spend my time just staring at that problem. Please go and ask someone who you know is part of your plan to go and move your Bitcoin. Now, I don't want them to actually move it. I just want to see if they've got the capability of doing it because then you can basically put everything aside and know that your estate plan is sorted if something were to happen to you today. And this is what I don't think a lot of people have actually done is gone through the disaster recovery. Have they actually tested their estate plan as to the recovery of their Bitcoin? Have they literally handed a piece of paper to a loved one and said, hey, I need you to move these Bitcoins. Now, there are ways and means around doing this without actually showing them your stack. And I understand most Bitcoiners don't want to share that information. But it's really important that they understand the process of that and how they would actually do it. Because, you know, I I just think about all of the hard work that's gone on. You know, you've been in this space for 10 years. You know, you've been doing this for, what is it, five, six, six years Yeah, just about five years of uh, podcasting. Yeah. Uh, um, And, you know, I remember, you know, the early conversations we had and all the help you gave our clients. And I think all of us have worked so hard to be at this point. Please don't drop the ball over the line in football parlance. You've done all this work. All you need to do is put the ball down, make sure your estate plan's sorted, and... If, if you want help, any guidance, um, there's I might get in the show notes just left up there a comparison table that we put up in for clients, basically all the things that we consider. Um, and it's a free service that we basically put up there and say, here's the things that we do and consider. Please go and rip this off and implement this in your own, in your own day-to-day. And if you're incapable or you don't want to do that, then I'd love to help you. But, you know, like... Uh, Everyone says, not your keys, not your coin. So we want to basically give that protocol to the world that, you know, hopefully it can bring peace of mind and secure those Bitcoins for future generations. Fantastic. Well, I'll put all the links in the show notes and it's the bitcoinadvisor.com. That's advisor with an E-R, the bitcoinadvisor.com slash comparison. And of course, Peter, I'll, uh, I'll uh, hope to speak again with you soon. And uh, thank you for sharing some, I think, very valuable insights for listeners because many of us don't want to think about us dying or being incapacitated, but it's going to happen someday to all of us. So let's uh, let's be serious about it and uh, let's be responsible about this. So uh, yeah, thank you, Peter. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Stefan. Show notes will be available at stefanlevera.com slash 486 and make sure to share this show with family and friends so they can learn a bit about Bitcoin estate planning. That's it from me. I'll see you in the Citadels.